Hello and welcome to another episode of Sewing is Hard with American Duchess. I'm Ooh. Lauren. And I'm Abby. And today we're going to talk about 1830s bodice construction. Woo! <laughs> So Abby and I did really different styles for our 1830s bodices. Both are accurate, but both are, are vastly different. So um, Abby, what style did you do? I decided to make my life as easy as possible by doing a back closing bodice. Now, with that being said, <laughs> as easy as possible. It's as easy as possible when it comes to construction. It's not the easiest when it comes to putting the thing on yourself. So <laughs> I just looked at originals and from there, I did a little bit of a mix of draping on myself and on my mannequin and then also drafting the pattern on paper. I did use Jean Hunnisett's graph of an 1830s bodice and period costume for stage and screen as kind of my base pattern shape to be inspired by. But then I did also use Work Woman's Guide for more information. Because if you look at Work Woman's Guide and you read Work Woman's Guide, which if you haven't figured out, that's a very important book for 1830s. Yes. They talk at length about the importance of grain line yes, in bodice so. construction. And so I used Work Woman's Guide and Jean Hunnisett and combined, I ended up making my bodice for myself. Now I did a front closing bodice, a, a lap over surplice bodice, so like a wrap bodice. And the benefit of that is I was able to get into it and fit it on myself. I could even fit the darts on myself, uh, but it, it did have its other challenges. For instance, I struggled a little bit with the silhouette because it came up so far on my shoulders to create the V uh, so that I didn't have like corset out and all over the place. Um, I didn't really benefit from the very wide off the shoulder look that you got mm -hmm. in yours, Abby. Mm -hmm. So I had to make sure that my shoulder seams came down far enough up on my shoulder and my sleeve started at exactly the right point. Otherwise it just wasn't gonna look period accurate. Yeah. The benefit is you were able to get it on yourself, but mm -hmm. you did experience some challenges when it came to fitting the gown. I did, yes. And, and patterning the gown. You, you had some, yeah. some mysteries. And this is why we say the back closing gown's easier because there were no mysteries. Well, there was like one small mystery, but, but you had some real puzzles <laughs> to figure out. Well, I had some fit issues through the side seam specifically. So the original gown that we studied for uh, as a basis for these projects has these fake side back seams, mm -hmm. these curved side back seams. They're not seams. They're just applied pieces of piping. I thought, ooh, that's cool. And I I love a shortcut, so <laughs> I also did that. But because of my shape, what that did, and because I did this front closing cross bodice thing with the way that that was on the fabric to get the pattern on the fabric correct, what happened is I had a bias edge on one side seam piece on the front and I had a bias edge on the back as well. And when I put those together, I had two bias together and they, they stretched mm -hmm. all over the place. So I had a really hard time fitting through this area of my body. If I had to do it again, um, I would not do the false piping on the back. I would do separate side back pieces and I would cut the side seam on the straight of grain, absolutely. Even mm -hmm. though that kind of messes with the plaid, I would definitely do that because of the way that it holds the fabric in place. Mm -hmm. Side pieces are addressed specifically in Work Woman's Guide. Yep, so I should have paid attention. <laughs> <laughs> You're experimenting. You're conducting a grand experiment. I did the three pieces. So I did the front, the side, and the back. And the angle of the side piece, what's on the bias and what's on the straight depends on your body type. Mm -hmm. So when you're making your 1830s gown, even if you're looking at a, at a paper pattern that someone else did, take that side piece into consideration with your body type and reference what Work Woman's Guide says about it. For a stout person, the selvage way or the straight of grain should run from the extreme point of the bottom of the back of the side piece and towards the middle of the top. And for slider figures, the selvage way or the straight of grain of the stripe should run along or nearly along the front of the side piece. So if the straight is on the front or the straight is in the back, that depends on your body. Another thing about the grain, and you sort of preface this, mm -hmm. the grain is important on every piece. It's very, very, very important on the shoulder seam. Oh my gosh, guys. Oh my gosh, guys. Oh my gosh, guys. Oh my gosh, guys. Have you ever made an <laughs> off-the-shoulder bodice that just slips and, and, and like buckles, especially here? You just can't keep it up. And you think, how the heck did they make these? It's all in the grain line. Mm. 
one point of the shoulder so the front is on the straight and then the back is on the bias. And this, do not not do this. This makes a world of difference. My shoulders of my gown are completely off. They sit right here on my arm. And they do not move. Now mine is a little higher up. My neckline's kind of mm -hmm. like here. And I have quite a long shoulder seam. It curves over the cap of the shoulder here. So what I did is instead of cutting my straight grain edge, and it's like dead straight, I bent my straight against the bias. So I maintain the integrity of the straight grain while still creating a curved seam. Before you actually sew up the bodice, you need to make piping. The easiest way to make your piping is to cut bias strips either one and a half or two inches wide and then take cotton knitting yarn and lay that in, fold the biased pieces of fabric over and then stitch the yarn into place either using very loose stitches on your sewing machine like I did or by hand using running stitches. Now to put piping on your bodice, what you do is first on one piece, so on my back piece, I marked out where I wanted the piping to go on my stitch seam area, laid the piping over top of that, basted it into place, and then I took my second piece, my side piece, again marked the stitch point on the lining of the fabric so I could see it when sewing, laid the pieces right side together, and had the piping wedged between, and then I back stitched the seams together. You can also do this on the machine if you want to, it's, it's really up to you. I just decided to sew my bodice by hand because I felt like it gave me more control. And you're going to do piped seams wherever you want them to be, so I did them on my back seams, my side back seams, my side seams, my center front seam and my shoulder seams. I didn't do them on my center back. I did them on my side back and side seams to have that really nice, clean, polished look. I also did them around my arms eyes as well, but we'll talk about that in the next episode. Now, you're also going to want to face the back of the bodice, just like I did. My original gown has this too. The way you do this is first you mark the half inch seam allowance on the center back of your bodice, cut away the lining, fold the fashion fabric over and baste it down into place. Then you're going to cut a two inch wide strip of fabric that's long enough to go down your center back of your gown. Mark the seam allowance points, fold those over and press them down. Then you're going to take that strip of fabric, lay it over top of the back of the gown, just slightly below the folded edge so that way it doesn't peek over, and then hem stitch very carefully the long side down. You don't want your stitches to be visible for the outside, so you're only going to catch the lining in this case. Where are this fitting? Oh god. To make fitting my gown easier, I basted up the center back in the position I wanted it to be, keeping the overlap in mind, and I fit the gown from the center front seam. Since my side seam, center back, and shoulders fit me so well, I sorted all that out in the initial mock-ups and patterning of my bodice. I didn't really worry about how those were fitting. I just wanted to make sure that I had a nice, good, smooth fit at my center front. So that's just a series of pinching, pinning, and adjusting of the center front seam. I also fitted my darts at this time by pinching, folding, and pinning the darts over into place, trying to keep them as symmetrical as possible. <laughs> okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go to my boyfriend, cut the basting in the center back off, so that way all of my pinning has been left intact, and then I can draw on the inside where the lining is what I need to do and where the markings are. I probably will actually just base the darts into place because I'm pretty damn happy with how they're sitting. Um, so, so yeah, um, let me get down here. Neckline is nice and flush, it's sitting and dropping off the shoulders. There's no gapping in the back, it's nice and smooth. A little bit of line matching there, unintentional. Um, but yeah, here we go, 1930s bodges. I didn't f it up, but I did make my arm poles way too small, so I can't wait already for those to get knocked out. I uh, just kind of clipped them in about a half inch and that gave me the ease that I needed to get this thing on it is, is tight. Whew. Might give myself a little bit more room. Sweet. All right guys, almost there. For the lining and the seams, you can see that I worked the lining and fashion fabric as one layer. And so I just back stitched the seams together, pressed them open, and then overcasted them to secure them into place. Darts. Darts. One of the most fascinating things about this period and the original gown that, that Abby has is the way that the darts were done. Mm -hmm. In modern sewing, we do the darts entirely on the inside. So you have just the very discreet seam on the outside. Mm -hmm. In the antique gown, and what we both did on ours, is the darts are fit from the outside. 
So you put the bodice on, and you if pinch. you have a slightly different side, right side Everyone's to left side, asymmetrical. you can fit that specifically. And then you just pinch them up, fold them over, and you top stitch them from the outside. So nice, small, tiny stitches. And then what's gonna be left over is the little bit of flippy flappy seam allowance. On the inside. And all you do is just press that over and just hem stitch it to the lining. It'll lay nice and flat and smooth. You're gonna have really nice fitted darts, and it's really easy to do on your Self. Yep, I fit mine on myself. I did too. In the mirror. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I got stuck. <laughs> So I had a crossover bodice, which means I could kind of like get that fit specifically. But Abby, did you have any issues with this area the in doublers. your bodice? Yes. I, I think this whole thing is actually really interesting because 1830s corsets have a large busk that creates the divorce of the bosom. But when you look at 1830s gowns, you don't always see that separation. Yeah, kind I of can, a mono. Yeah, you get like a look. mono boob. I tried to pattern for this when I did my mock-up, I tried to accommodate for this. When I fit the gown for the on the silk and the lining, I tried to accommodate for this. But damn it, <laughs> the moment I put the piping in, I was getting wrinkles right between my tatas. I would take it out, refit it, pin it, sew it, try it on, still wrinkles. Take it out. I think I did this like three or four times. And when you get to that point, I'm starting to worry about my fabric getting scarring and holes in it and stuff looking really bad. And of course, it's at the very center front right where my boobs are, so everyone's gonna see it. It's getting really like worked up about this. So I decided with the advice and blessing of the Gigo Girl Gang group that I could pad my bodice and it yeah. was fine. Pad that shit out. I padded it and let me tell you guys, it totally worked and made my life so much easier. So here's where I added padding to my gown. It's just some cotton batting that I've stitched into place. So it helps give the mono boob look versus the wrinkly in the middle look. Now, <laughs> we know that, because we have surviving dresses from like the 1840s and 50s yeah. where they've got these like big old titty pads yeah, in and, there. And I've seen pads for like underarms, <laughs> yeah, so like around this like out. It, around here. It's there all the time. Especially with off the shoulder bodices. Yeah. But padding the center front is also a thing that happened too. They didn't always put the padding in the dress itself. Sometimes mm. you'll see antique shifts or patterns mm -hmm. that have like a flap that goes over the corset. the corset to smooth that out. Or they put a piece of fabric there, a piece yeah. of flannel or something for the same purpose. Yeah. So if you have that issue, there are ways to fix it and padding is one of them. Once you have your bodice constructed, you need to attach it to your skirts. There's a few ways you can do this, but the basic rundown is that you create a waistband between your bodice and your petticoat. And it's just a straight piece of fabric that's usually about one and a half to two inches wide that you whip or top stitch your skirt and your bodice to. That's how I did mine. It's just a nice straightforward piece of fabric. My one mistake that I made, I did the lining wrong. I should have left the linen out or done another lining to cover the raw edges in there, but I can do that later. <laughs> so I put my bodice on and then I found basically not my true waist. It's a little yeah. bit above the true waist. Yeah, because you have a lot of bulk coming up mm -hmm. in the petticoat and all of your underpinnings too. Yeah, I just kind of eyeballed it, looking at what was flattering for my body and what worked for the correct silhouette. And I pinned the belt onto the bodice and then I top stitched from the outside or prick stitched from the outside the waistband to the bodice. For my skirts, I just had folded those over, they were pleated and I whipped those onto yeah, the, waistband. To the waistband. And I pressed everything flat and it works like a dream. I did my waistband on my bodice in the same way, but I did it over my skirt. So I already had my skirt on, I put my bodice on, closed it all up, and then I applied the straight strip of fabric over the top, turned up the edges where it needed to be so that everything would lay nicely. And I completely finished the inside and outside of the waistband on my bodice. You put a belt on top of that. So mm -hmm. even if we weren't wearing contrasting color ribbon belt, I would have made, and you probably would have made, a self-fabric belt mm -hmm. again to go on top of it instead of instead of not. You wouldn't leave it well, plain. Well, you need to have that belt buckle. Yeah, you gotta show you gotta show belt your belt buckle. buckle. You yeah. gotta have some jewelry. There, right? You gotta do something. <laughs> Belts were kind of a, they were, they were a thing. thing. They were a thing. It's they like were, the 1950s. They, they were, were a part thing. of a style. You wouldn't leave it off your dress. Yeah. But the really important thing is getting the fit right. And as Abby says, a little bit shorter on the waist rather than all the way fully down because you don't want that to ruck mm -hmm. up, yeah. especially with an off the shoulder bodice. And it will ruck up if it's too long. So shorter is better, especially mm -hmm. for the 1830s Just and that doll like appearance. 
Closures, guys. How do you get these bodices closed? <laughs> what did you do for yours? Uh, I followed the original gown. So I used hooks and eyes on mine and it worked a treat. Taking inspiration from the original gown, I did hooks and eyes spaced about an inch apart and stitched so there is a overlap over the back of the gown. So that way it's nice and closed. And also the skirt opening has closed up as well. You can also see that the waist eyes are in a slightly different location than the rest of the gown. It was, I mean, sewing hooks and eyes can suck, let's be honest, it's tedious, but you do have the ability to adjust the fit in yeah, an eighth of an inch, yeah. like itty bitty bit. My skirt doesn't have any hooks and eyes. There's actually a whole one inch overlap. So that was how I closed the slit of my skirt and kept it from like gaping open all on my corded petticoat. <laughs> I learned that lesson. But you, this is where a front closing bodice is really kind of genius. Yeah. You didn't well, have to deal I, with that. You were right. not at the mercy of me to yeah. get you into your gum. I could get entirely dressed by myself. So I had this whole like multi-system thing going on. Did you have on. ties? I did not have ties. I just had four or five sets of hooks and bars to keep everything up and in, in place. And it worked fine. Yeah. So I got it all on there. I got the belt on. The belt helps hold things in place too. And it was very easy to get it on and get dressed. You could also use lacing, mm -hmm. I think. But for the most part, I think the hooks are, are faster. Yeah, it makes life easier. That's it for the 1830s bodice. But wait, we haven't covered the most important thing, which is the sleeves. And the reason we didn't talk about that <laughs> this time is because they are a whole other video in themselves. Yes. So tune in next time to Sewing is Hard with American Duchess. Thank you for watching this video. We hope it was helpful and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Hey everyone, Abby here from American Duchess. I just want to let you know if you want to check out more videos about 1830s dressmaking and sewing is hard, head on over to the playlist. We have the link somewhere around me right now. And also, if you love what we do and you want to support American Duchess, head on over to Patreon and become a patron. We have swag, patterns, live casts, and private video conferences, all sorts of awesome things, even shoes. But if you love what we do and want to be a part of our community, we would love to have you.